textual analysis. Yeah, don't be afraid. Um, human being like everybody else. I was just wanna name that uh, that ceremony where you seen that so many people were kinda into that judgment day. What was that called? Yeah, it's the it's one of the one of the rites of the pilgrimage, the Hajj, where uh, Muslims are instructed to go to Arafah, which is basically a little hill and this plain outside Mecca, where Muslims are encouraged to, because um, Hajj is seen as like a once in a lifetime thing, right? Like Muslims, uh, many Muslims in Muslim countries are poor, so what they do often, they will save the whole life savings just for the Hajj alone. So, uh, traditionally, people would walk across continents just to get there for the Hajj, and sometimes they would die on the way. So it's a very uh, important thing where, where people stand before God, they stay there the whole day, sometimes under umbrellas because it's so hot, and they just pray to God and ask for give forgiveness. And, uh, and it becomes a very emotional time because you're looking out at literally millions of people from every race, tribe, village, nation, and language background, and we're all praying to the same God. And there's no distinction, as the uh, professor said, that they wear white garments, basically two pieces of uh, cloths uh, thrown over you, so you can't tell who's a king and who's a, who's a beggar. Everybody is equal before God. We're all asking God for forgiveness, and uh, it's it's considered a very spe special event, which is a foreshadowing of the Day of Judgment, where the billions and billions of people are stand before the throne of God uh, and are judged for their uh, actions, for their deeds, for what they believe, what they did do, what they didn't do, etc. So it's a, it's a very spiritually moving event, which I look forward to myself. I hope to do it. The philander at the day on the plain of Arafah should be interesting. What was the, uh, the event that you said you did attend or uh, partake in? I did, the, uh, I did the Umrah. Umrah is a voluntary Hajj, which involves less, uh, less rituals and, and, uh, as compared to the Hajj. The, the Hajj itself is an obligation upon Muslims to do, like I said, uh, once in their lifetime at least, if they're financially, physically able. Uh, but Umrah can be done uh, voluntarily as many times as you want. Even Hajj can be do done more than once, but it's only an obligation to do it at least once. But Umrah is, uh, I've done Umrah twice in Mecca, and basically you're just circumambulating the Kaaba, praying, uh, and just doing, sh cutting your hair at the end as a, uh, as a way of getting yourself out of that ritual state of uh, what they call Ihram, which is a state of uh, consecrated state that you enter into to get into the uh, pilgrimage, and then you, you, you exit it with a certain ritual, which is just cutting some hair. So basically I've done that twice, yeah. And uh, it was an interesting experience. It was amazing, actually, because I, I, I have always seen pictures of the Kaaba, seen it on TV and everything, just walking. Well, the mosque is huge, first of all. It took me like half an hour just to walk inside the building to get to the, the center of the mosque. It's, it's, I think it fits like one or two million worshipers. It's huge. So I'm walking through these big pillars, and I'm like, man, where's the, where's the Kaaba? I want to see it. I've been waiting to see this all my life. And then finally, I, I'm getting closer and closer and closer. I can see this big black cube, millions of people just circling around it and, and praying. So it was an amazing experience. And just, you know, it was an emotional uh, time for me. I saw those little birds flying around inside there as well. And I'm su surprised. It was like all the floor was completely clean. There's no bird droppings anywhere. It's like thousands of birds just nesting inside the mosque. But I don't know how they keep it clean. It's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. And it was very hot there too in the daytime. It's unbelievably hot, you know. But uh, they are pretty advanced over there. Uh, the, the, the tiles, the marble tiles in the mosque are filtered with air. So there's actually under, underground uh, air filtering systems. Uh, and so the air comes up through these little holes in, in the floor so you don't, your feet don't burn, even though the tiles are white and not black. So. Any other questions? Are you a convert to Islam? Yeah, I'm a convert. Is there a specific yeah. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I became uh, very religious at the age of 20. I'm 36 now. I uh, became a very devout Christian. I, I went to New York City. I joined a uh, religious group of friars, monks, called the Franciscans. I considered the priesthood as a Roman Catholic. Uh, that didn't work out, and uh, I tried uh, what my, my two aunties have done. They left Catholicism and became born-again uh, Pentecostal Christians. So I became like a, a born-again Christian. Tried that for a couple of years. But uh, it was mostly due to theological reasons. Again, going back to Islam's uh, strict, pure, monotheistic beliefs that God is completely one and unique, uh, and he does not become a human being because he is unique. He's the creator, and we are the creation, and there's no confusion about you know, us and him in that way. I found the Islamic uh, teachings, the foundations of Islam, much more compatible with my, what my soul considers the truth. So I did a lot of praying, a lot of uh, investigating. I uh, took at least four months of 
reading about Islam, praying about it, and then I, I was convinced that it was the truth for me, and I, I accepted Islam 10 years ago. And, uh, since then, I've traveled to six or seven Muslim countries. Uh, my wife is here as well. She's a Muslim from Africa. Uh, also, um, I'm doing a degree in Islamic studies and trying to study Arabic, and I give lecture. I actually give uh, sermons at the mosque here. <coughs> and I think I'm the first Newfoundlander to actually give lectures in, uh, in the mosque. So, yeah, trying to do my part as a Muslim, and, and, and what I'm doing here is actually an act of worship for God. This is my intention to uh, to spread the teachings of Islam. I'm not trying to convert anybody, but God says in the Quran that uh, He just simply asks us to convey the message. Uh, and it's up to the individual to either accept it or reject it. And, uh, that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in your lecture, you talked a lot about uh, the common roots between all the Abrahamic faiths and the Torah. And as someone with the experience yourself, uh, one question I've never asked before is that uh, what do Muslims think of, say, the writings of the Apostle Paul? Like, well, what are their thoughts on them? I, mean, I can sort of guess what they would be. Hold on a second, I'm going to put on my boxing gloves here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Paul, um, I'll have a whole can of worms here now. Uh, for us, we consider that, uh, in, my, in, my, in my lecture I mentioned Judeo-Christianity, Unitarian Judeo-Christianity. I consider their understanding of God more compatible with what Muslims believe. But Christianity, uh, as, I don't know if you're going to be studying that or not, later in history it evolved uh, as the Christians were no longer seen as Jews. Christianity, through the teachings of Paul, went to Europe and became mixed with the, uh, it became, I guess you could say, it became influenced by Greco-Roman pagan, paganistic beliefs. And they had their own trinity uh, at, the, at the time, Zeus and Her 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 Heracles and all these different gods that they worshipped. And Paul was basically catering uh, and, and preaching to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish believers. And there was a conflict between the Jewish, strict Jewish Christians who were monotheists uh, and the what you call the uh, European or Gentile Christians who were not so uh, pure monotheistic and they were very easily, easily uh, uh, in my opinion, corrupted in terms of monotheism. I, I believe that Paul, the, the Quran, as far as I know, never mentions him by name. And that I believe that, in my opinion, he has changed the teachings of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, because Jesus said there was only one God. And nowhere in the Bible did he say, I am God, worship me, and you have salvation. There are many verses in the Bible, and I'm aware of all of them, that are used to support the divinity of Jesus. But uh, it was through the, the, and I can't blame Paul for all of this. This, is a, this again, is, is a, is a, um, a, a what I say, a theological development of Christianity, especially from the, from the 4th century onwards, after the Council of Nicaea, where you start to see the Trinity as now the official doctrine of Christianity. If you go back earlier than that, you see that all the, all the early Christians were actually Jews. And so Paul was actually in uh, opposition to what Peter and James said. James was actually the, the leader of Christianity in the Church of Jerusalem after the time of Jesus. They were strict uh, law, Torah-abiding Jews. They believed in one God. But Paul was saying, no, you don't need to have circumcision. You don't need to, to uh, do this and do this and this. And he was putting a more of a, uh, uh, more of a symbolic uh, interpretation of the, of the law, whereas the Jewish Christians, followers of Jesus, were more uh, literal in their interpretation. So are you saying that James and Peter in the New Testament both uh, basically are uh, in, in disagreement with what Paul was saying? In many issues they were, yeah. Even in the Bible it says that uh, uh, Paul had a uh, disciple by the name of Barnabas. They had such a huge rift between them that they actually separated and, and never reconciled and they went their, went their own ways. There's also another tradition that says Barnabas wrote his own gospel. Uh, that's a whole, a whole other debate. And in that gospel, it actually says that Muhammad is the messenger of God. But again, that's Christians sake. They say that's not an authentic gospel, but whatever the case. Uh, yeah, there was, there was definitely disagreements between them. Paul even said in some of his letters, he rebuked Peter to his face for saying to the Gentiles that you have to follow Jewish kosher laws, and they had a lot of disagreements. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I don't know if you're mistaken, but I'm pretty sure that uh, James referred to Paul as the great deceiver, right? Because, yeah, uh, yeah. In the, the book that I had, James, the brother of Jesus, right? That's what there was an that's early. Go ahead, said. It, it was, was actually an early Christian group called the Ebionites. The Jewish Christians later became known as the Ebionites. Uh, and of course, during the time of Jesus, they were called Nazareans. They were not called Christians. Jesus was never known as a Christian. Christian was actually the first term, the first time the word Christian was used in Acts chapter 2, I think, was used in a derogatory sense to insult people. 
Romans actually uh, came up with the term Christian, as far as I know. But Jesus and his religious group were a sect of Judaism called the Nazareans. And uh, going back to, what, what did you say again? What was, what was the, the uh, it was a book called James, the brother of Jesus. Yes. I forget the name of the... Yeah. The so this group, which became known as the Ebionites, they believed that Paul was, again, I hope I'm not offending any Christian here, they believed that Paul was demon-possessed. Uh, and that in his letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he says that an angel of Satan was sent, was sent to him to punish him and, and torture him in the flesh, uh, they interpreted that as that he had a false conversion. Because he said in, his, uh, in, in Acts, I believe it was, when he fell off the horse and he saw the light and he's, 